BBC4 Collections, specially chosen programmes from the BBC Archive. For this collection, Max Hastings has selected interviews with Great War veterans filmed in the 1960s. More programmes on this theme and other BBC4 Collections are available on BBC iPlayer. I joined my battalion um, in December 1915 in what we used to call very cushy trenches. Uh, this was uh, at the southern part of the British front, down towards the Somme, between Goncourt and Serre. And I spent the spring of 1916 uh, really rather enjoying myself. In those days, um, when the war was not very active, it was really rather fun to be in the front line. Uh, it was not very exacting, and indeed it was not very dangerous. Uh, one was having a sort of out-of-door camping holiday with the boys, with a slight spice of danger to, to, to make it interesting. And the worst there was to it was the heavy working parties that one had to do at night, which pursued one all round the front. But I, for example, used to do a lot of patrolling in no man's land. Uh, nothing happened, as a rule. And these Boy Scout operations, in those days when I knew no better, I simply regarded rather as fun. But as the spring went on, we all began to learn that the great battle was coming. We all knew something about it months before it, were, it was announced. It was obvious that there was going to be a great push in the spring, and this was to be the great moment of our lives. And then we knew that a great test was coming. And as it drew nearer, the line livened up. It began to get much more dangerous and not nearly so much fun. There was a lot more shelling being thrown about. And many guns were brought in to support our artillery and enormous dumps were formed behind. And more men were brought into the line and the regiments were crowded up closer together. And uh, we all began to work up to this great crisis. And uh, uh, the war then assumed a different shape. And I don't think it was ever the same again afterwards as it had been in these um, uh, almost romantic days. Before the song, when in cushy trenches, you could still regard it um, lightheartedly. I got up at uh, dawn in the morning. I was acting adjutant of my battalion on the morning of the 1st of July, and I went up to take to my command post in the trenches from which we could see over the country between Goncourt and Serre. And um, when I got there, they, here were messages coming in from the front companies to say that they were all in order and that everything was right. We tested our lines back to the artillery. And I can only say that I have never been so excited in my life. Uh, this was like a boy going to the play the first time in his life. For, and this is indeed what it was. And the noise rose to a crescendo such as I'd never heard before, for which we, for the first time, used the word drum fire, which is, which is a, a, a great description of it. A, a, a noise which made all bombardments that we'd heard in the previous days seem like nothing at all. And uh, the, the effect of the bombardment uh, created a sort of hysterical feeling. And, uh, at, and at zero, I sent back a message to brigade headquarters to say that we were all ready and were going to deliver our smoke cloud and then, uh, um, uh, we, uh, at the moment, we could see um, the outburst of smoke and gas from our front line driving, blowing in the right direction towards the Germans, and then somebody shouted, there they go. And I looked over to the left, and here were the London Scottish, who were on our left, uh, running forward across the three or four hundred yards of green grass between our village and Goncourt Wood. And then they vanished into the smoke, and then there was left, nothing left but noise. And after this, we saw nothing, and we knew nothing. And we lived in a world of noise, and simply noise, for hours. It could be just as tiring out of the line as in the line, and it was sometimes worse. When you at last got out into rest, what was um, somewhat ironically called rest, uh, you supposed you were going to have a quiet time and some fun, but it was generally spoilt by night working parties. Uh, very often, um, your company will be called out at night 
to march up to the line again in the dark and in silence to carry stores up to the front line because for the last mile or two towards the trenches everything had to be done by hand. Uh, you collected stores from a big dump three or four miles back and the nearer you got to the enemy the more sure it was that it had to be man that it had to be manhandled and although people talk about communication trenches and duckboard tracks they generally weren't there and if they were there there was every probability that the enemy were going to shell them and destroy them uh, the more nice looking they were the more dangerous they were because the enemy spotted them uh, now what have we got to take up to the front line we've got to take everything to begin with food and drinking water uh, secondly ammunition for the men rifle ammunition and machine gun ammunition and after that, trench mortar ammunition, which was very clumsy, difficult, awful, awkward stuff to handle. But the worst thing of all were the trench stores. If you were ever going to get your trenches into any degree of comfort, you had to carry enormous bundles of sandbags, forks of timber, planks, ready-made-up duckboards, worst of all, coils of barbed wire. And barbed wire is the most damnable stuff to handle that you can imagine. It was made up in great coils, which weighed, I suppose, half a hundredweight, uh, which we carried on a stake over two men's shoulders. Now, even in daylight, this is a most awkward thing to handle, and you were very likely to cut your hands to pieces before you got it in there. But you had to do it in the dark, in silence, and tramping through the mud, and for the last part of your journey, along a trench. And going along a trench means stumbling along a dark, wet ditch with an irregular floor with a kink in it, a right-angled turn every few yards so that you can't see where you're going. And to manoeuvre these cursed things round uh, a corner uh, was uh, something so fatiguing that, that it can hardly be described. Um, and one has to remember that the men who did it were physically tired out when they started. And they were probably, worse than that, mentally tired out because they'd just come out of a trench tour for a rest and this was the kind of rest they were getting. Now, there was no escape from this. This had to be done. The ammunition had to get there. The barbed wire had to reach the front to protect the soldiers who were, who were fighting. And if you were going to get any comfort at all, you had to have the planks and trench boards. Um, you go stumbling along in the dark, cursing, falling and in, slipping into holes, tripping over wires, and when you trip over a wire, that probably means you're breaking the telephone wire to the front by which the, 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 the operational messages have got to be sent back. <clears throat> and if you make the least noise or attract too much attention, the enemy will open fire. If the worst of all is uh, the traffic problem, because there are several parties of this kind going along the trenches and they have to be controlled through a labyrinth of trenches, up trenches and down trenches, and you can have a traffic jam in, in old bad trenches as bad as a London traffic jam. Then the enemy open fire or somebody has to get out on top. And if you have to get out on top, there you are standing exposed. The enemy send up one of their flares and you're alone, uh, standing with the impression that the whole German army is looking at you. Um, and perhaps they are. Well, then you struggle down again and struggle forward, and perhaps you get your stuff to the, to the front line and hand it over without disaster. Then you've all got to march home again, two or three miles stumbling through the trenches again, and then perhaps five or six miles back to your billets. Uh, and, and arrive and, at dawn, and uh, your next day's rest isn't going to be very enjoyable. Through the long period of fixed trench warfare, uh, our world was divided by a sort of iron curtain, uh, by no man's land, beyond which was a world into which we could never penetrate, about which we knew nothing, which was inhabited by bogeymen, people who would kill you if they ever saw you. And on our side of the line, uh, our world was quite different. On our side, everyone a friend. On that side, everybody something terrifying. Um, almost unreal. When you stepped off the leave train at Victoria, of course the first effect was just that here you were home for the holidays. But um, very soon uh, that began to wear off. And at any rate, um, from 1917 onwards, um, one felt that there was something unreal about leave. I'm bound to say that I got myself into a state of mind where it was the trenches that was the real world and it was London and 
my family uh, that was unreal, that I couldn't understand or find or uh, accustom myself to. Now, of course, I was very young. This is a boy's reaction. And my view is that it was probably very much worse for a married man. This world of the trenches, which had built itself up for so long a time, which seemed to be going on forever, was the real world, and it was entirely a man's world. Women had no part in it. And when one went on leave, what one did was to escape out of the man's world into the woman's world. And one found that, um, however pleased one was to see one's girlfriend, and I'm speaking only of the light emotions of a boy, not of the, uh, the deeper feelings of a happily married man, um, one could never somehow quite get through. However nice and sympathetic they were, um, the girl didn't quite say the right thing. And one was curiously um, upset, annoyed, by attempts of well-meaning people to sympathize, which only reflected the fact that they didn't really understand at all. And there was even a kind of last sense of relief in which you returned to the boy. When one went back into the man's world, which seemed the realest thing that could be imagined. Cut. By the time it got to the Battle of Passchendaele, uh, I was, as soldiers went, a pretty old soldier. Um, I'd already been through the Somme, and I'd been through the very bad winter of 1617, which, among other things, was the hardest winter for 20 years and was very tough in the trenches. And I was not in very good shape at all in the spring of 17, and I feel that even before this battle at Passchendaele started, I was getting somewhere near the end of my tether. I don't think I could go on much longer. Uh, every soldier, I suppose, had this breaking strain, and um, um, when I look back on myself, um, uh, I, I see that I was getting near it, um, before this final test came, and then I got into what proved to be the toughest assignment I ever had in my war service, which was the Battle of the 4th of October at Passchendaele, when I was commanding a frontline company. Well, um, we advanced, um, just like those battles, under a, a, an enormous barrage, a much heavier barrage than I'd ever heard before. We ran into a lot of Germans, and we had a, a lot of very severe fighting in the first five minutes, in which I myself got mixed up in a, in a really awkward um, shooting out affair, rather like um, gangsters shooting it out on a Western film. And however, we shot it out, and we won that little battle, and we got through. And I found that uh, all the various sections of my company had all, in turn, run up against little parties of Germans like that, and had fought it out in the shell holes at very, very close range. And by the time we got to our objective, I found that my company was completely scattered. Uh, both my officers, all my sergeants, and three quarters of my men were killed or wounded. And there was me and the sergeant major and a scattered handful of men, which we had to get together somehow. Well, we got them together somehow, and we settled down on our objective in a group of shell holes, and there we sat for three days. And um, on the second day, it began to rain, and rained continuously, so that the bog of Passchendaele spread out into a lake, and to begin with, we were sitting um, up to our knees in mud and water uh, in rather late autumn, very short of sleep, and having just been through this very severe mental strain of the battle itself. And uh, there was after this, there was no further fighting. The Germans did not, in fact, counterattack us at that point, so they were very quick to counterattack in that battle, and we had to be on the lookout for it all the time. However, they showed us very scientifically, and on the second and third days, we just sat in the mud, uh, being very heavily and very systematically shelled, with um, pretty heavy stuff. Mostly, mostly the big shells that they used most from their 150 millimeter guns, which we call five nines. Well, you could hear these shells coming. It took, um, I suppose, it's very difficult to say, five or six seconds, perhaps, to come. And in five or six seconds, you can pass through quite a number of, of um, uh, psychological changes. Your mind can get through various phases. And uh, uh, I don't know whether it is possible to describe the uh, mental changes that one went through. Uh, all day long, one had nothing to do but to sit in the mud, shivering, wet and cold, 
with no hot food, very short of sleep, and having been really rather shattered by the, by the um, fighting of the previous day, I mean mentally shattered by it, and um, uh, try to keep up appearances in some way or another uh, as the shells arrived. Um, they weren't very frequent. There was generally one just arriving and another one just beginning. And when a shell arrived, it would plump into the mud 10 or 20 yards away or 50 or 100 yards away and would throw out, or would burst with um, a, a shattering shock, which always upset me very much. I've al always been very much upset by noise. I hate noise. And, uh, and the noise of the explosions always um, was a, a great burden and pain to me. And after it had burst, uh, the splinters of the shell flew off, all of them good killing splinters, and might fly 20, 30, 50 yards away from the point of impact. And they would take another second or two before they'd all settle down in the mud. And uh, although a shell had burst 50 yards away, you, you might find one second later uh, uh, a, a fragment of jagged iron, nearly red hot and weighing half a pound, arriving in your shell hole. Well, uh, you'd no sooner managed one than the next one began to appear, and you'd hear in the distance quite a mild pop as the gun fired five miles away, and then, then um, a, a humming sound as it approached you through the air, with a noise rather like an aeroplane coming, growing louder and louder, and as it grew nearer, you would begin to calculate with yourself whether this one has got your name on it or not. Well, we were always told that you never heard the shell that hit you, and I think this is probably true, because most of them travelled faster than sound, and uh, therefore if you heard it, it probably wasn't going to be a direct hit on you, but it might be going to fall 20 or 30 yards away from you and be a great danger. Uh, and we thought, we pretended to get very expert in the sounds of shells, and um, the old soldiers thought they knew exactly when they were in great danger and when they weren't, but I have really some doubts whether they were as clever as they thought they were. I think one could easily be misled about this. The, the noise would grow into a great crescendo, and it would suddenly get louder and louder, and until it was like the roar of an aeroplane coming into land on the tarmac. And at a certain point, your nerve would break and you'd throw yourself down in the mud and cringe in the mud till it was past. When you were listening to this sound of the shells coming over, uh, every now and again, you would, uh, there would be one which you made sure was coming very close indeed. The noise would get louder and louder, and the machine seemed to accelerate until it was making a great roar like an aeroplane coming in to land on the tarmac. And uh, there would come a point at which uh, your resolution would break. You'd say, this is one for me. And in this flash of time, in a, in a fifth of a second, you decide that this is the one, and you throw yourself down into the mud and cringe and on, in, in, into the bottom of the shell hole. And then all the other people were around do the same. And, um, well, you may save your life by doing that. But sometimes you miscalculate. And this is a shell that isn't for you at all, but it goes sailing busily on and plunks down on somebody else three or four hundred yards away. Then you get up and roar with laughter. And the other ones who laugh at you for having been the first one to throw yourself down. And this, of course, is, is hysterics. Uh, it becomes a kind of game in which you cling on and try not to let the tension break. And the first person in a group um, who shows the sign of fear by giving way and taking cover, um, he's lost a point, and it counts against him, and the one who holds out longest has gained a point. But in what game? What is this for? Now, and this is the, the uh, problem that I am still unable to solve, that after this long time, and after I'd been 18 months uh, in France and had been through several big battles, um, that I was still trying to pretend to be brave and not succeeding very well, and so were we all. The thing is a, a social experience, not an individual experience. And speaking for myself, I was always very much more frightened if I was alone in one of these situations than if I was in a group. But I've heard other soldiers say exactly the opposite. Uh, that uh, would be a matter of individual temperament. But I, in trying to reconstruct this, these extraordinary experiences, um, I think of it always in terms of um, what one must call esprit de corps because there is no other name for it unless one is to call it ganging up. Uh, here we were, a gang of boys who were 
uh, committed to this extraordinary range of activities and had to go through with it, and all the time one was saying to oneself, if they can take it, I can take it. Now, you, you struggle uh, with um, uh, th these stresses, which are almost overpowering, and which may become quite overpowering, which may break you down in hysterics. And, of course, everybody who remembers battle scenes remembers occasions when um, someone did go off into a, a complete mental breakdown, into hysterical fits of various sorts, which the doctors eventually uh, admitted and called, described as shell shock. But th there were ways in which you could maintain your self-control. And uh, there is some strange connection between small physical actions, if you um, um, hum a little tune to yourself and feel that you can quietly get through this tune before the next explosion. It gives you a sort of curious feeling of safety. Or you start drumming with your fingers on your knee and, uh, and have an, a, 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 a quite irrational desire to complete this little ritual. And the, the, these minute things uh, 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 protect you from the nervous collapse, which may come at any moment. But then suddenly the nervous collapse does come. And there comes the moment when a shell is right on top of you. And then you break completely. And, and, and uh, uh, cringe on the ground in a most undignified attitude. After which you've got to pull yourself up together and start again. The awful thing being that this is not a, an isolated experience, but it goes on continuously, minute after minute and even hour after hour. And uh, as, uh, in this particular experience, which was the worst that I happened to go through, it went on pretty well continuously for about 36 hours. All day and not quite so bad at night, but then at night it was very cold and wet and you very much wished you were somewhere else than sitting in the dark in the mud. Um, then at last, uh, this rather drastic experience came to an end and somehow or other we extricated ourselves from the mud and drew back to an extremely uncomfortable camp on the other side of the Ypres Canal Bank, and then we had to count the cost. Now, where do we go from there? Uh, now, I, I, I suppose I might have said this was the point where I would start a revolution or a mutiny or decide not to do it again or something of that kind, as they did in some of the other armies. We didn't take it that way at all. And uh, we had no sooner withdrawn ourselves from this shambles and got together what we could, then we began to build up the regiment again and get ready for the next time. And this seems to me extremely difficult to explain. Now, um, I had lost both my officers and all my sergeants and three two-thirds of my men. And um, here I was, I was 20 years old, um, a young acting captain, and I had to begin to form a new company. Well, to begin with, I was in a state of complete physical and mental prostration. And I think for a few days after the battle, I was getting near uh, having a nervous breakdown. But uh, when one is young, um, uh, physical rest very quickly puts that right. And in quite a few days, I was almost as good as ever. This seems to me very strange. Um, I had to begin by uh, actually collecting and organizing the men and finding out what had happened to those who'd been killed and those who'd been wounded. I had to write 22 personal letters to the wives and mothers of men in my company who'd been killed. Um, I then had to choose privates whom I was going to make into corporals and lance corporals who I, was, who I was going to make into sergeants at one jump to start again. And then we got a draft of a hundred very good men up from the base. Then we started all over again and had a new company. And at the end of a month, we were ready to do it again. And this seems to be the strangest thing of all. This is one of the things I find hardest to explain. In the last year of the war, I was sent home to train recruits. And I spent it at a camp in Northumberland where we used to take in what were called A4 boys in batches. These were boys who were fit, but underage and untrained, who had been called up under the Conscription Act and had to be made into soldiers in six months. As soon as they were 19 years old and trained, they were pushed off to France in batches. Um, they didn't, in, by these days, the regimental system had quite broken down. They might come from any part of England and they might be sent to any regiment. Um, I didn't altogether enjoy this experience. Um, I didn't much like being a young, fit man and pushing off these other young, fit men uh, to fight instead of me. But um, I suppose somebody had to do it. 
Uh, when they came to us, they were weedy, sallow, skinny, frightened children. Um, the mm, refuse of our industrial system as it was in those days. And they were in very poor condition because of wartime shortages of food. But after six months of good food, fresh air, and physical exercise, they changed so that their mothers wouldn't have recognized them. We weighed and measured them, and they put on an average of one stone in weight and one inch in height. But far more than that, at the end of six months, they were handsome, ruddy, upstanding, square-shouldered young men who were afraid of nobody, not even the sergeant major. And when we pushed them through this crash program of military training, out they went to France in batches. And I didn't awfully like to see them go, and I often wished that I could have gone with them myself. However, go they went. And of the batch that we sent out in September 1918, many were in time to die at the breaking of the Hindenburg Line. <laughs>